Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Again, I invite you all to join with us at 7 p.m. as we come together uh, virtually for our prayer meeting. We look forward uh, to when we can have this in person on Wednesday nights. But as a reminder, we are meeting on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. for prayer meeting. So I invite you all to come for that. But as we begin today, we'll be looking at James chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 6. And as you can probably figure out, we'll be done with the book of James uh, here in the next several weeks. After that, I invite you to send in recommendations uh, that you would like to hear, uh, preferably from the Old Testament. And as we continue to serve the Lord, let us go now to him in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given unto us this very day. You've given us this day in your providence that we might serve you in all that we do. And dear God, as we ask your mercy in these days in which we live, God, we pray that we would not only find peace in your kingship, but dear God, that you would comfort us through your word and through the witness of your people as a reminder that we are not alone in the midst of these things, but dear God, you have sent your Holy Spirit, to be a comforter under our hearts and unto our souls. Dear God, we ask that uh, you would watch over uh, your covenant people. Dear God, that you would strengthen us in your grace, uh, that through the reading of your word and through prayer and through godly fellowship, that we uh, would find in that joy and happiness uh, that men seek, that we would be protected from the temptations of the evil one, that we would be protected from the old man within us, dear God, that we would serve uh, the living and the true God and not the dead idols of this age. Dear God, we ask your blessings be upon uh, your people who are suffering at this time. Dear God, we pray especially for those who are feeling the uh, pain of loneliness during uh, this age. God, we pray that in your mercy that you would not only shower them with your grace, dear God, but that you uh, would bring an end uh, to this day. That we might gather together once more in the house of the Lord and worship you in the way that you've called us to worship. Dear God, we pray as we continue to go through this time that we would see your judgment upon us for what it is. Dear God, that we would repent not only individually, not only as the church, but dear God, as a nation. And that we would turn our eyes to you again God, that we would covenant and claim Christ as King, and that we would long uh, to see the gospel go forth unmolested in this nation and all the nations of the world. For to God, we know and rest and trust in the promise that you have made, uh, that your kingdom shall go forth. For God, may we rest in these truths. For God, may we find, again, our peace in your company and grace. For God, we pray as we come to your word this evening that your hand would be upon our hearts to God, lift us up into your presence and shower us with the testimony of your love. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, again today, we turn to James chapter five and we'll be looking at the first six, six verses of the fifth chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are mothy. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Amen. Now, as we come to these verses, they seem somewhat out of place for what we just read. But as we pay attention to the context of the book of James, this is another reminder from the apostle that the hand of God will be upon those who think they can escape the judgment of God, especially with those who claim to be of God. 
One of the things that is part of this condemnation is you notice how the things done in secret cry out unto the Lord. Notice there, for instance, in verse uh, 6, or in verse 4, excuse me, where it says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept by, by fraud, cry out. So notice what it's saying, right? The wages of the laborers are crying out. And who are they crying out to? Well, of course, they're crying out unto the Lord. So these unseen things done by fraud are calling out unto the Lord, and the Lord hears the cries of these sins, right? That's the image we're meant to see here. And in hearing those sins, what happens? The condemnation of God is going to come down upon them. And part and parcel of this condemnation is going to be the fact that they will have to face the Lord our God on the day of judgment, right? The final day of judgment. This is part of what is meant there at the end of verse 5 where it talks about the pleasure and luxury fattening their hearts as in a day of slaughter. The idea here being that they are laying up these treasures on earth. They're committing these wickednesses. They are doing all these evil things. But all it's doing is building themselves up for a greater condemnation on the day that the Lord Jesus Christ returns and judges all of the earth. Because this goes back to something that James has been uh, beating from the very beginning of this book. You know, we talked about, back in chapter 2, about the language that James uses concerning works. In James 2.14 it says, What is it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Well, think about that in chapter 5. These are people claiming to have the name of Christ. They are outwardly holy. They put on a face, and when they're at church, they are good Christians. But their deeds speak louder than what they pretend. Their deeds show themselves to be no different than the evil men and women of the world. And James is, is saying as loudly and clearly as he can, there is no hiding in God. This especially goes for those in authority. And when James here talks about the rich, he is talking about the rich, right? This isn't a metaphor. And he's, and he's also talking about those who have a position through which they affect the lives of others. So politicians, for example. A politician can stand in front of a, a, a lectern or, or something like this and make all kinds of claims about wanting to help the poor, uh, seeking justice in the land, but they go back to their million-dollar mansion and eat their thousand dollar ice creams and live in opulence and all kinds of things like this. And what do we call politicians like that who claim to want something but live in a totally different way, right? We call them hypocrites. You know, there was a case not that long ago of a, Phil, uh, a Pennsylvania representative who happened to be a Republican and who happened to be very active in the pro-life movement. And it came to light that he had attempted to pay for an abortion for one of his staffers. And of course, as you can expect, the media got all over them. And they should have. Right? Because we have this man who claimed to be against abortion, but in his real life was procuring one for someone that he was having an adulterous relationship with. Right? The, the, the wickedness of that cried out, and God's judgment came down upon him. And we should expect the same for anyone in public authority, whether they be inside or outside the church. And James here is saying that this is going to happen. And one of the blessings is that even if there is not judgment in this life, 
The promise is there will be judgment to come for such a person. And we see this, for example, in the Ten Commandments themselves. In Exodus uh, chapter 20, we have the example in the third commandment of this uh, taking place. It says there in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And this is a reminder to us that even if we don't see that judgment, it will take place. And we know that because God tells us that. And that's one of the reasons why we are to, again, trust the Lord in this regard. Right? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So again, this idea that we can have a public face and a private face in the Christian life is total nonsense. Who we are in private is who we are in public. If we come to church and, and try to uh, be the holiest of holy people and then go home and partake in all kinds of wickedness, whether it's financial or sexual or in, uh, in any other way, then we are going to be held account by God. And James is, again, driving home this point. We cannot be two people. It's not possible. This goes back to what he was talking about at the end of chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Again, the idea being, we hold all things in the hand of the Lord. This goes for making plans. This goes for the life we lead. This goes for everything that makes us who we are. Everything is under the sovereign hand of God and Christians have to live as if they actually believe this to be the case. It's not enough for us to confess with our lips that we believe Jesus Christ is king over the earth and that Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross and that Jesus Christ has given to us his holy word and we want the Ten Commandments up in the classrooms, at schools, etc. If we don't follow the Ten Commandments, it doesn't do us any good if they're up at Bethany Elementary School. Matter of fact, it does damage to us, right? Because it just shows us to be hypocrites and it does damage to the witness of the gospel. And this is really what James is concerned about in this whole book, right? Is the whole idea of hypocrisy and sincerity of faith. You know, one of my one of the clips that gets shared on uh, on TV and on Facebook and on the internet a lot is a, 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 a press conference that the old uh, Arizona Cardinals coach Dennis Green had one time, and. You know, people are talking about them after they've gotten uh, gotten whipped by a particular team. And Dennis Green gets mad finally and just says, they were who we thought they were. Right? And the world should be able to say that about the church. They are who we thought they were. Unfortunately, when the world looks at the church and says that, they mean hypocrites. And far too often, they're right. The church can, 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 can preach until its face is blue that it doesn't approve of sexual immorality. But if the church engages in sexual morality and excuses that particular sin, then what right does it have to tell the world not to engage in it? The, the church can, can claim that it doesn't like um, you know, theft but what's the reality of what is being dealt with in James 5? Your gold and silver corroded, and the corrosion will be a witness against you and eat your flesh like fire. They put their faith in their wealth, in all these things, and what is the consequence? Destruction. Condemnation. Whereas for the believer, what should be the response? Right, the response to what we read here in James chapter 5 should be, first of all, a pointing of the finger at ourselves. 
and asking the question, how does this apply to my life? How do I put my faith in princes? How do I put my faith in riches and in wealth and in uh, garments and all of these kinds of things? And again, these, these idols that we have placed where we should have put the providence and love of God. Again, that's the big question here. When we, we think about this crying out, again, God sees what we do. And God sees everything that we do. And we can't live in this kind of idea that as long as nobody else sees it, it's okay. Right? That should be evident nonsense to us. But too often, that's not the case. We, we treat God as if uh, he's blind in our bedrooms right? or blind in our bathrooms or blind in our homes. That's, there's, there's some kind of spiritual force field around it. And if we, again, claim the Christian faith, which calls us to love God and love our neighbor, then we need to love God and love our neighbor in our homes. We need to love God and love our neighbor in the fields. We need to love God and love our neighbor in church. In this, this call to uh, die to self and to live to Christ is not just a slogan. This idea that we are to uh, be witnesses to the world around us by our holiness is not just something for the fundamentalists to do. Right? Again, sin is not an excuse for licentiousness. Sin is not an excuse for living a non-mortified life, that is, putting sin to death in our hearts and in our minds. And this isn't supposed to be a burden to us. In fact, one of the things that this passage is teaching us is that it's really a burden to live the other way. Think about, again, as a preacher or whoever is reading the word of God and you are convicted in your heart by the Holy Spirit as to what's being said or what's being read. That's a great burden, is it not? And the freedom of the gospel is to no longer live under the burden of sin. The freedom of the gospel is no longer to live under the condemnation of God. In fact, that's what Christ has come to do for humanity, for all those who would rest and trust in him. To remove the burden of sin, the consequences of sin, the reality of sin from their hearts and from their minds. Right? Do we want to live with a conscience that's constantly crying out unto the Lord? Do we want to live this burdened life where we're being two-faced with the world and with the church? And the call of the gospel is to do what? To repent and believe. All right? That's the message that Jesus preaches in Mark 1, 14 and 15. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And part, again, of this call upon the gospel upon the hearts of believers, as we see it here in James chapter 5, is the fact, notice what it says in verse, verse 6. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. He doesn't need to resist. Why? Because your, your conscience, I mean, your sins call out unto the Lord themselves. Right? Remember what Jesus said about that? He did not come to condemn and why did he not come to condemn? Because we were condemned already. Right? We were already dead in sin. We were already uh, worthy of the destruction that sin is caught. Right? What are the wages of sin but death? But what is Christ? Christ is eternal life. Christ is the freedom to live in the liberty of the gospel. And so brothers and sisters, as we close our time with James chapter 5 today, and as we hear this word against the rich oppressors, again, we need to be willing to put ourselves in the place of these rich oppressors. How 
Do we not only put our faith in riches and garments and the idols of this age and cause our conscience to cry out unto the Lord, but how do we excuse this in our own homes, in our own church, in our own community, our own society? And this, this promise that we see here, again, ties into everything that James has said. Do we live by faith or do we live by sight? Is our faith genuine? Is it sincere? Is it real? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we living for Christ or are we living for the world? Well, brothers and sisters, as a, as a sinner myself, you know, I can confess that this is true of me. I have fallen short of the glory of God. I have sinned before the Lord. I have lived uh, this hypocritical life. And I think that's true for all of us. And so the call here is all around. And we are moved by what we read here to confess our sins before the Lord, repent, and to turn to Christ and know the freedom of the gospel. Amen. Take care and have a blessed evening.